given for display to the soldiers of the King. As an ensign fair we lift it up today, as a ransom ones we sing. Marching on, marching on, for Christ count everything but loss, and to crown him king, toil and sing, beneath the banner of the cross. Though the foe may rage and gather as the flood, let the standard be displayed. And beneath its folds as soldiers of the Lord, for the truth be not dismayed. Marching on, marching on, for Christ count everything but loss, and to crown him king, toil and sing, beneath the banner of the cross. Over land and sea, wherever man may dwell, may the glorious tidings know. Of the crimson banner, now the story tell, while the Lord shall claim his own. Marching on, marching on, for Christ count everything but lost, and to crown him king, toil and sing, beneath the banner of the cross. When the glory dawns, tis drawing very near, it is hastening day by day. shall disappear, and the cause the world shall sway. Marching on, marching on, for Christ count everything but lost, and to crown him king, toil and sing, beneath the banner of the cross. Amen. You may be seated. Good evening, and thank you for being here for our Wednesday night uh, Bible study and uh, prayer meeting. If we could have our ushers come forward at this time, we'll take up our offering right away. Uh, Wednesday night's offering goes towards our benevolent fund, our Pastor Richard Hurd fund, in honor of Pastor Hurd and his generosity. And so he wants to uh, give tonight, knowing that this could be an opportunity to be a witness to somebody um, that the church can be a help and a blessing to. Let's have a word of prayer. We'll take up our offering this evening. Let's pray. Lord Jesus, we do thank you so much for this time that we have to be in your word tonight and to be here. And Lord, I pray that you would use uh, this money, Lord, to your glory and honor. Uh, help us to love you, Lord. Help us to lift up your name. Help us to keep you focused on what we uh, do here this evening. In Jesus' name we pray these things. Amen. for that offertory. Praise the Lord. And Logan, if you wouldn't mind having a word of prayer to dedicate the offering, please. Dear Jesus, thank you for this night. We're able to come to your house and worship you. Please do this offering, Lord. Please help us to you to your holy glory. Um, please do the rest of the night. Please help us to do it well. In your name, amen. 
Hey, man, I just realized as I was sitting up here um, uh, that my Bible, I don't know where it's at, and inside my Bible is the lesson for tonight. Um, so I thought, well, I'm going to come up and do the prayer letters. Maybe I'll send someone to go look in my office to see if they left it on my desk. But then I realized the prayer letters are also in the front of my Bible. And so, Jen, are you going to look to see if it's in my office? <laughs> He's going to go check to see. It. There it is. She must have grabbed it for me. And so, praise the Lord. And so Jaron's going to bring our message for this evening. We appreciate his. <laughs> Thank you. All right, we do have a couple of missionary letters. And uh, let's see here. The first one we have um, for this evening is from Monica Hoffman. I remember uh, Jim Hoffman passed away. And uh, so she has been sending out regular letters, sort of updating what is happening with the ministry. Um, and uh, as Dick just shared with me uh, just a little earlier this evening, not too long ago, that, that I think he spoke with her about it. She said this is something she enjoys doing, something that kind of keeps her uh, busy. And so she's keeping up with what the ministry's Canadians for Christ is doing, and she sends this out. Um, and it says here, I hope you have a very blessed Christmas. This is her Christmas letter. It says Merry Christmas right at the top. Cherish your time with your loved ones. We never know if they will all be with us for the next Christmas time. As our family enters this Christmas season, my gym is greatly missed. However, I am so thankful that we can have hope and joy in our hearts because of the gifts of our Lord Jesus Christ. And praise the Lord uh, for that. Um, she also has some information here I'd like to read to you. I'm happy to report that the skid of John and Romans is ready to be shipped to Norway the men of uh, Bering Precious Seed Oshkosh uh, repacked the skid and counted everything that we uh, have left for Norway. Um, he will be, we will be uh, shipping 14,780 John Robins and 21 whole Bibles. Um, I know uh, the pastor there will be glad to get them and distribute them at the schools. Um, I talked with Morton. Gem, Gemlestad, early December, he's already getting requests for the revised KJV Norwegian Bible, and, is not, uh, and it is not even printed yet. I'm glad that folks are excited to get the Bibles. Morton thinks that our, by August of 2024, he will be finished with his work. Please keep praying for him as we all want it's done correctly. I know I could not do what he is doing. Please continue to pray for... Um, Dr. Ron and Igna Neely uh, in their needs with the Swedish Bible revision. Um, as our last conversation, he's working to finish his revision and to identify how many to print in our first run. We are continuing to raise needed funds to prepare for when these projects are ready. We appreciate your faithful financial support. Thank you for your prayers, gifts, and all that you do. God bless and have a Merry Christmas. We're very thankful to be able to continue to support this ministry um, uh, as um, Jim Hoffman, of course, is with the Lord and uh, a tremendous amount of work that he has done over the years, but the ministry continues on and praise the Lord that we can continue to support his wife in that ministry. Um, the second letter that we have for tonight is Master's Craftsman letter. Um, uh, and they have um, here, a couple of projects. Sometimes we just don't have enough room in the newsletter to tell you about everything that TMC has been involved in. So let's get you caught up. In September, TMC built a pulpit and communion table for Brookside Baptist Church. It was a fun little project we could do in my shop at home because Brookside was renovating their existing auditorium. They wanted these two pieces to match the new decor. We think they turned out very well, and uh, Brookside um, uh, we, and Brookside was extremely excited when they took delivery. Um, uh, we were glad to play a, a small part in this reno in these reno their renovations. October seven, TMC began an entryway addition on Sh Shawano Baptist Church, which required digging a f digging a footing, laying a block frost wall and uh, uh, building the roof structure over the new entryway to the church. We also framed the vestibule inside and framed the door opening to the glass doors to be installed later by the door provider. By October 18, as you can see in the pictures, 
the entry roof was complete and we were uh, headed back home. It was, an, um, it was amazing to see how the Lord put together the volunteers to help this small church and provide tremendous weather in which to do the project, as well as all the materials and equipment uh, we needed to, to do the work quickly. And so praise the Lord um, for the work that they are doing there at Master's Craftsman and the blessing that they are to the churches that need these kinds of projects done. And so praise the Lord, praise the Lord for that. We're very thankful to support both of these, Master's Craftsmen and Scandinavians for Christ. And that, that is tremendous. Um, at this time, our young people can be dismissed to go to their class. And I do have a few announcements to make here concerning our church and what is coming up. Uh, this thing, this Sunday will be next, well, the last day of the year, Sunday, Chris, uh, New Year's Eve. Um, and so we're at the end of the year here. So praise the Lord, we, we made it. <laughs> well, we're almost made it. We're almost there. Uh, December 31st, this Sunday, there is an afternoon service, um, and we're excited about that. And as part of that afternoon service, we're going to have a potluck, and we're asking people to bring chili um, for lunch for that afternoon service this Sunday coming up. So please come, please stick around for the lunch, and please bring a chili to share. Um, if you would like to enter your chili, we're going to have a chili cook-off. This is the second annual chili cook-off, second time we'll be doing this. Um, if you win the chili cook-off, you will be the proud one-year owner of the traveling trophy. And I actually brought it up tonight so we can show it off here. It says right on the top, it says right here, Berean Baptist Church Chili Cook-Off. And so that's your little plaque there. And you can display that wherever you would like in your home uh, to let everybody who knows the visits that you won the chili cook-off at Berean Baptist Church. And so I was bringing this up and some of the teenagers said, we should paint that gold. Now that's kind of a cool idea, actually. We should. And maybe people actually would display it <laughs> if it were gold. Anyways, uh, and so you could be the proud owner of this trophy. It's a traveling trophy. You get it until our next chili cook-off. And so uh, keep that in mind. So you bring a chili, enter it in for the contest, and... Uh, and, uh, and uh, you can win the chili cook-off, and the deacons will be judging this, and so we need folk to enter uh, to make sure we have enough chili. So this Sunday, uh, that'll be an exciting time. In the afternoons, so we have our morning service, afternoon lunch, uh, which is the chili, and then um, after that, we're going to have an afternoon service, um, and it'll be a teen takeover service. So we'll have our young people doing all of the service things. <laughs> and so uh, all the specials, all the song leading um, and everything, all the announcements, all of that stuff will be done uh, by the young people. And so we're excited about that. We've got three different young men, including Ryan Mills, who technically isn't a teenager. He's in college now, but he'll be preaching for us. And then um, uh, we got a couple more young guys that will be preaching. Got a couple, got a young guy leading songs. And, and uh, I'm not talking to Mitchell yet about doing the announcements. I might talk to him, see if he can do that. I'm not sure if he's... Able to do that or not? We can talk them into it. But that'll be this Sunday. Otherwise, we'll find someone that can do it. We're excited about this. And uh, praise the Lord. <laughs> You're quick to volunteer, right? <laughs> and so, um, uh, so that'll be this, this Sunday coming up um, in the afternoon service. And so praise the Lord for that. Uh, that's this Sunday night at 8 o'clock is a teen New Year's party and uh, Castaway Pirates theme. So it's actually Castaway versus the Pirates is the whole thing. And, and there's a sign-up sheet in there in the back. And there's about, I think there's about 40 or more teenagers signed up on that. Now, many of the teenagers have put their name down three or four times. That's why we have about 40. <laughs> Not really that many coming. Um, but that sheet, you walk by, and say, man, that's really filled out. A lot of people are going. But it's just a lot of the... You know, it's at the Patrick's house, and the pastors have put their names on there like four or five times each. But anyways, um, uh, so that, that'll be this, this Sunday night, and uh, starts at 8 p.m., and uh, is over at midnight. You could be there about 12, 15 or so. Make sure to dress warm or be prepared to go outside for part of the activities of that night. Make sure the teenagers, if you have any going, make sure they know that. Uh, and to bring a flashlight, a flashlight um, may help as well. And so keep that in mind. Um, there is a Lake Superior Preaching Conference January 5th and 6th, and uh, you're invited to come to that. You will enjoy that. Um, I go to this every year. Um, Laura and I typically go, and it's a good time, and so keep that in mind. 
Um, and then because of that conference, the John and Roman distribution and soul winning will be the second Saturday of the month, January 13th. And so I encourage you to be part of this as well. Um, we are continuing in Winona, getting out John and Romans and getting the gospel out. And so that's, um, that is the 13th, the second, uh, second Sunday. The 17th is an annual, second Saturday, sorry. 17th is an annual business meeting. Keep that in mind. Uh, and our verse for the year. Psalm 100, verse number 4. Enter into his gates with thanksgiving and into his courts with praise. Be thankful unto him and bless his name. What a tremendous truth we have and that we can thank the Lord for his goodness to us. And by the way, God is good to us. Every day, God is good to us and we ought to be thankful. And praise the Lord uh, for that theme we've had for this year, thankfulness and being thankful to the Lord for his goodness, and so praise the Lord. All right, tonight we are going to continue in the book of John. And so we are in John chapter 18. And we're going to go through verse number 14. John chapter 18, verse number 14 1 through verse 1 through 14. We've already been all the way through John chapter 17. We're looking at these last days of the Lord Jesus' life here on earth as a, as a man. And of course, he is going up. He's just hours away from going to the cross. Um, and of course, um, that is God's plan, right? That he would send his only begotten son to die on the cross for our sins. And so he's just not far away from this at all. And so we have seen how he has comforted the disciples, how he has instructed the disciples. Um, he has, um, uh, you know, uh, served them. Um, so many things we see the Lord Jesus doing in his last days of his life when he's about to face such agony and such difficulty um, and falsely accused, and all the, the shame he'll have to go through and the difficulty he'll have to go through, but yet he, he spends the last several days here of his life serving and, and helping and instructing and comforting others. And what a tremendous testimony that is to us as we look at, you know, sometimes we have difficulties in our own life, right? Um, but are we, are we uh, taking time to recognize and to help others? And that's the Lord Jesus Christ, of course, is our perfect example. Um, and so we saw um, him giving instruction to the disciples. Uh, um, and then in the last chapter, we saw this prayer um, that he prayed. And in this prayer, um, he talked about the Lord um, uh, God, the father giving him the disciples. And um, it is interesting that the Lord Jesus started really with a large group um, uh, and uh, in, in John chapter number, boy, I want to say it's John, I better not say if I don't know for sure. But he had, uh, John chapter number six is what it is, right? So in John chapter number six, he feeds a large group, feeds 5,000. And this large group of people that were there are referred to as disciples as you study this out in John chapter number six. And they they sought after him and followed him, um, uh, but their desire was to follow this guy who could perform miracles and feed 5,000 with a small lad's lunch. And, and they said, man, this guy, he has to be, you know, from God, because look at what he's doing here. Um, but then as he began to teach them, many of those disciples, most if not all of them, turned and left him. Um, uh, uh, and so, and, and they betrayed him and left him, um, and there were just a few that would stay, and that would be the 12 disciples um, that the Lord will now put time and effort um, uh, into. And so these 12 that he is working with, of course, one of them had already left at this point in John chapter number um, 18, Judas, which would betray him. Um, he had already left them, and uh, the Lord had already predicted that he would leave and that he would betray him. Um, uh, and uh, so he's got really this, the 11 in the last few chapters that he's been working with and, and, and teaching and helping and, and developing. Um, uh, and as the Lord pours himself into these disciples and, and trains them, we learned 
that there's so much more that they're going to learn after the Lord Jesus departs and leaves. And that the Lord Jesus has to leave so that the Comforter, the Holy Spirit, will come and teach them. And we saw that just a couple just a couple chapters ago, right, where he said in, in chapter number 16, verse number 7, Nevertheless, I tell you the truth. It is expedient for you that I go away. For if I go not away, the Comforter will not come unto you. But if I depart, I will send him unto you, right? So the Lord says, I have to leave. I have to depart. Um, and and uh, the Comforter is not going to come until I do depart. And so he's got to leave and, and be out of the way. He explained to them in chapter number 14, um, in verse number 26, but the Comforter, which is the Holy Ghost, whom the Father will send in my name, he shall teach you all things. And it's amazing how much the disciples would learn of God as they have the Holy Spirit in them. Acts chapter number 2, right, is the Holy Spirit indwelling all believers, uh, and how much more they learned about the things of God. And we talked about that, right? We talked about how there was very little understanding of the Jew and Gentile all being part of one body uh, until God showed that, the Holy Spirit showed that to Peter in Acts chapter number 10 as he went to go to Cornelius' house. And as God showed that to Paul, and Paul, was his main ministry was to teach that, right? We're all part of one body, the body of Christ. And there's so, much, so many other things we could show that they learned after the Lord uh, died and went to the cross, ascended up into heaven, and sent the Holy Spirit, uh, and the Holy Spirit taught the disciples so much more uh, than they even knew when they were with the Lord Jesus Christ. And so we understand that the Lord Jesus has to go to the cross. He's going to send the, the Comforter or the Holy Spirit. And that Holy Spirit, by the way, teaches us still to this day. Now, we need to caution ourselves when I make that statement. <laughs> the Holy Spirit isn't teaching you anything other than or outside of what you would learn in the Bible, the Word of God. Um, uh, the ministry of a prophet in the sense of the Old Testament you know, prophet, you know, we were talking about, we were in First Kings just this last week, and we we're talking about uh, the death of Jeroboam, I think it is, and it talks about the prophet that came, Ahijah, and how Jeroboam's son was going to die, and so Jeroboam sent his wife to go see Ahijah, and Ahijah, of course, being a prophet who was blind at that time, but his wife disguised herself, and it was, you know, under, under instruction of Jeroboam, and so she came to him, and the first thing, you know, the Lord told uh, Ahijah, you know, Jeroboam's wife is coming. So she, she comes up, and the first thing he says to her is, hey, Jeroboam's wife, what are you doing here? You know, I'm paraphrasing, but um, uh, this, this Old Testament prophet heard directly from God, and he knew things because of God's instruction to him, right? God told Ahijah that Jeroboam's wife was coming. God told the man of God, um, uh, you know, to go and... and uh, uh, and let Jeroboam know that there's going to come a king, Josiah, years from road, who will, who will overthrow the kingdom, and, and, and Jeroboam's you know, house will be ruined or whatever. And then the, the, the altar, the golden altar he made, will, as a sign of that, the golden altar, the golden calf that he made will break, and the ashes will come out. And, and God told this to the man of God. The man of God told this to um, uh, Jeroboam, and, and in that sense of a prophet, right, God giving special instruction to a man and, and, and man declaring it, and hey, this is what God said. Right? In that sense of a prophet, we don't have that anymore. Pastor, why is that? Because we don't need that. We have God's word complete. We have the, the complete word of God from beginning to end. So when I say the Holy Spirit will teach us what God wants us to know, I'm speaking of the Holy Spirit opening up your eyes and helping you to understand his word. There is unfortunately many men today who are pastoring their churches as if they are like an Old Testament prophet. God's giving them special instruction that they're giving um, uh, to their people. And unfortunately, we end up with a lot of really bad doctrine and false doctrine as a result of that. And so one needs to be very careful about that. But the Holy Spirit certainly taught the disciples after he came down and continues to teach us today. How often, if you've taken time to study and read the Bible, how often has the Lord opened up something to you never noticed before? 
And you say, boy, I've never, I've never seen that before. It's incredible. And, and the Lord shows you things and, and how, how wonderful that, that is. Sometimes it's, it's, it's sometimes a good idea to be looking for something specific when you are reading the Bible. For example, in chapter number 17, verse number 2, John 17, verse 2 says, As thou hast given him power over all flesh, that he should give eternal life to as many as thou hast given him. Right? So there's that phrase, thou hast given him. And I read a commentary who said um, seven different times you see that phrase, thou hast given him, in, in John chapter 17. Now, that was interesting. And so I began to read, trying to look for all the times that you see that he says that. And you see it in verse number six. I have manifested thy name unto men, which thou gavest me out of the world. Thine, uh, thine they were that thou gavest unto me, and they have kept thy word. Verse number nine, I pray for them. I pray for the, wor the world, uh, but for them which thou gavest me, uh, for they are thine. Okay, there's another time, the, f what, the fourth time it's, it's said. Um, at the end of verse number 11, it says, Those whom thou gavest me, that they may be one as we are. That's the, another time it's mentioned. Uh, the sixth time it's mentioned in verse number 12, While I was with them in this world, I kept them in thy name, those that thou gavest me. Right. So as you're looking for that phrase, those that thou gavest me, if you're looking for something specific, it helps you because you're now paying attention to the word. You're saying to yourself, boy, where is that? And, and you're, you're looking, you're saying to yourself, boy, the guy said there's seven of them. Is there seven really? And so you're reading each word and finding, making sure you're not going to miss it. And then you get to verse number 24. Father, I will, I will that they also whom thou hast given me um, uh, be with me where I, I am. Right? So you say, oh, there it is, there's number seven. But you've, you were carefully reading each word. It helps to Look for something specific as you're reading the Bible. It helps you pay attention. Maybe you would say, boy, I want to know, um, I'm interested in prophecy. If I, as I'm reading the Old Testament, how much of it would be something that would pertain to prophecy? Is there something prophetic about these words? And you say to yourself, I want to, I want to know more about that. And so you're, in the back of your mind, you're specifically looking, but thinking to yourself, is these things, are these things Prophetic, you know, are they are speaking of prophecy. It helps us to pay attention to the words and how important that it is. We're paying attention to the words of God, and so the Holy Spirit will teach us, and 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 things will come to light um, as we read His Word. And so we have the Holy Spirit teaching us to this very day. Um, is is my point here now? So the Holy Spirit is promised by the Lord. The Lord has told the disciples, and He has really throughout His lifetime, He told the disciples that. He would be going to the cross, and they were not necessarily listening to that. They weren't ready to receive that kind of news. Um, uh, but the Bible specifically says, in a couple different times that is mentioned, in John chapter number 2 is one of those times, right, where they, they remembered his words as he said those things. And, and uh, later on, after he goes to the cross, they'll say, boy, I remember how he said that. And, and so the Lord brings things to mind. Um, uh, and so now the disciples are here with him at the end of his life, and he is with them, and that brings us up to chapter number 18. Um, and so John chapter number 18, verse number 1. Now I'm going to have a word of prayer, and then we'll get into our chapter for tonight. Let's pray. Lord Jesus, we do thank you so much for your word, and Lord, I pray that you would help us to learn from you. Lord, help my mind to be cleared of any distractions that may stop me or keep me from saying what you would have me to say. And Lord, I pray that you would help us to learn about you tonight. Thank you for what you've blessed us with. In Jesus' name we pray these things. Amen. Verse number one, uh, verse number one through three here. When Jesus had spoken these words, he went forth with his disciples over the brook Kedron. Um, where, were, where was a, uh, a garden into which he entered and his disciples. And Judas also, which betrayed him, knew the place. For Jesus oft times resorted thither with his disciples. So they're going to a familiar place where he had been many times with them. They knew where this place was and they were familiar with it. Uh, verse number three, Judas then, having received a band of men and officers from the chief priests and Pharisees, cometh thither with lanterns and torches and weapons. So here they are at this garden um, uh, over the brook uh, Kedron. Okay? Um, uh, one commentator said this, from the altar there was a channel down to the brook Kedron, and through that channel the blood of the Passover lambs drained away. 
When Jesus crossed the brook Kedron, it would still be red with the blood of the lambs which, he had, which had been sacrificed. Spurgeon said the very book, the very brook, this very brook, would remind him of his approaching sacrifice, for through it flowed the blood and refuse from the, refuse from the temple. Apparently, this would be a brook that came from the temple where the sacrifices were made, and much of the blood from those sacrifices would um, uh, would uh, would go through this brook Kedron, and so it would be a reminder um, uh, to the Lord as he's, of what He's about to face and what He's about to go to. Um, this was the Garden of Gethsemane. Okay, Matthew twenty six verse thirty six and Mark fourteen thirty two, and so we're talking about the Garden of Gethsemane and how they arrived here at the Garden of Gethsemane. Um, it was a familiar place. They had been here before. Uh, they knew what it was, and we see that in these verses. The Bible says in verse number two, and Judas also, which betrayed him, knew the place, for Jesus oft times resorted, resorted thither with his disciples. You're getting the idea here that Jesus isn't hiding out. <laughs> He's not trying to get away from what he knows is coming. He's going to a familiar place. He's going to a place where Judas knows where he probably would be. Um, and so it was a familiar place. Um, it is plain that having consecrated himself for the impending sacrifice, he now made no attempt to hide from his enemies, but went to the, uh, the place where Judas would normally expect to find him. And so here he was um, uh, at this place where they were very familiar with, and, and uh, the disciples knew where it was, and Judas even knew where it was um, as he had been there before. Of course, Judas shows up in verse number 3, Judas then, having received a band of men and officers from the chief priests and Pharisees, cometh thither with lanterns and torches and weapons. It is interesting that they would come with weapons, um, lanterns and torches and, and weapons. Um, uh, I don't know what they expected to have happen there. Um, uh, many commentators talk about the uh, the idea of a band of men and the the you know the Greek word behind band would signify possibly as many as 500 men or more that were there and this 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 crowd of men that were coming um, uh, to uh, you know to get with Judas to get the Lord Jesus and so they came the Bible says with lanterns and torches and weapons verse number four. Jesus, therefore, knowing all things that should come upon him, went forth and saith unto them, Whom seek ye? They answered him, Jesus of Nazareth. Jesus saith unto them, I am he. And, all, and Judas also, which betrayed him, stood with them. And so you'll notice, and this is, I've pointed this out several times before, um, in your Bible, the King James Version of the Bible, um, they will sometimes add words to help complete a thought. You'll notice in verse number 5, it says, They answered him, Jesus of Nazareth. Uh, Jesus said to them, I am he. The word he is italicized, meaning the translators added that word. Um, so what Jesus is really saying is, I am. Jesus answered them with the phrase he had often used, with this claim, claiming to be God, connecting his words to the many previous I am statements recorded in the Gospel of John, especially John chapter number 8. Take your Bibles, if you would, to John chapter number 8. I think we've even looked at this recently, but it's not going to hurt us to look back a little bit. John chapter number 8. By the way, we see him claiming to be, or using that phrase I am, in John 6, 48. John 8, 12, John 9, 5, 10, 9, um, 10, 11 through 14, 10, 36, 11, 25, and 14, 6. And okay, also connecting him with God uh, himself. Um, uh, and so we see here in John chapter number 8, okay, um, you remember they were uh, questioning him, the, the Pharisee that were trying to uh, catch him or get him. Verse number 52 of John 8, then said the Jews unto him, now we know that thou art a devil. Here, here's the Jews accusing Jesus, the son of God, right, as being a devil. Now we know that thou hast, hast a devil or that he has a devil. Of course, these Pharisees are so off, off base here. Abraham is dead and the prophets. And thou sayest, if a man keep my sayings, he shall never taste of death. Art thou greater than our father Abraham, which is dead? And the prophets are dead, whom makest thou thyself? 
Jesus answered, If I honor myself, my honor is nothing. But is, uh, it is my Father that honoreth me, of whom ye say that he is your God. Yet ye have not known him, but I know him. And if I should say I know him not, I shall be a liar like unto you. Isn't that interesting how direct he seems to be with these people? I shall be a liar like unto you, but I know him and keep his sayings. Watch this, verse 56. Your father Abraham rejoiced to see my day, and he saw it and was glad. Then said the Jews unto him, Thou wert not yet fifty years old, and hast thou seen Abraham? Jesus said unto them, Verily, verily, I say unto you, before Abraham was, I am. So here, Jesus Christ is claiming to be, I am. Then took they up stones to cast at him, and Jesus hid himself, and went out of the temple, going through the midst of them, and so passed by. And so here, the Lord Jesus Christ also claiming to be I am. Of course, it is Exodus chapter number 3. Let me get some time here. We'll go back there quickly. Take a look at it. Jesus claimed to be I am. In Exodus chapter 3, Moses sees the burning bush that is not consumed, and he's, it grabs his attention. The Bible says in verse number 2, The angel of the Lord appeared unto him in a flame of fire out of the midst of a bush, and he looked, and behold, the bush burned with fire, and the bush was not consumed. And so he decided, man, I'm going to take a look at this, and what is this all about? And God begins to give him instruction and in what he should do, and he's to go into Egypt, and tell the elders of Israel um, uh, to come out, you know, and um, he said in verse number 12, I will certainly be with thee, and this shall be a token unto thee that I have sent thee when thou hast brought forth the people out of Egypt, ye shall serve God upon this mountain. Look at verse number 13, and Moses said unto God, Behold, when I come unto the children of Israel, and say unto them, The God of your fathers has sent me unto you, and they shall say to me, What is, uh, what is his name? And what shall I say unto them? Uh, and God said unto Moses, I am that I am. And he said, Thus shalt thou say unto the children of Israel, I am has sent me unto you. And so God the Father in that burning bush was claiming to be I am. And so when Jesus says or claims to be I am in John chapter number 8 and many other places, as well as our passage of scripture tonight, John chapter number 18, when he says in verse number 5, Jesus saith unto them, I am, right? He's claiming to be God. And what a, what a powerful statement that that is. And so, um, he immediately says as they come in, whom seek ye, right? So he is immediately drawing the attention to himself as they're coming in. And they said in response to him saying, whom seek ye, they're looking for Jesus of Nazareth. And then Jesus said unto them, I am. Um, uh, and Judas also, which portrayed him, stood with them. Verse number six, as soon then, as he had said unto them, I am he, they went backwards and fell to the ground. Isn't that interesting? Um, uh, so the Lord says, I am, and some kind of a great display of power just knocked everybody over. If this was indeed, and I've, I've not really dug deep into whether how many, how many people were there, right? How many people are included in this band of men? Um, but there are some commentaries that make a big deal about this, right? It's a lot of men. It's not just Judas. You know, I always picture in your mind four or five soldiers, maybe. Um, uh, but the idea that it's a band of men would suggest there's a lot of them. You're talking about this whole crowd. It doesn't say a few of them, right? Um, it says um, in verse number six, as soon as any has said unto them, I am, they, that's all of them, went backwards and fell to the ground. The whole, all of them are knocked down, fall to the ground. Um, and so that's a tremendous display of really, <laughs> the Lord Jesus Christ being in absolutely in control of the situation. Um, uh, the Lord didn't have to, uh, you know, give in, other than the fact that it was his divine plan. He would, of course. Uh, but as far as power goes, right, it doesn't matter how many soldiers they had. They're not going to defeat the Lord Jesus Christ. Um, uh, and he displays that even in some, to some extent here in verse number 6. Verse number seven, then asked he them again, whom seek ye? And they, and they said, Jesus of Nazareth. And so, which is kind of an odd thing, right? He knocks everybody over. And I imagine there's a few moments of, well, what just happened? What's going on here? And maybe they're picking themselves back up. And, 
And the Lord, draw once again, draws his attention towards himself. And he says, uh, and he asks them again, Whom seek ye? And they said, Jesus of Nazareth. Jesus answered, I have told you that I am he. If therefore you seek me, let these go their way. So not only is he drawing attention to himself, but he's telling them, don't leave the disciples alone. Leave these men alone. I'm, you know, I'm the one you want here. Let them go their way. And so um, uh, you can see how the Lord um, is protecting them. We're going to talk about that in a little bit. Verse number nine, that the saying might be fulfilled, which he spake of them which thou gavest me, have I lost none. And he said that in the previous chapter in the prayer to God the Father. Um, and he said that he has not lost to any of them. Uh, verse number 12, it says this, chapter 17, verse 12. While I was with them in the world, I kept them in thy name, those which thou gavest me, and have kept, and none of them is lost, but the son of perdition, that the scripture might be fulfilled. Now, of course, would be Judas. Uh, and so he is, just as the Bible says, right, just as scripture says, okay, um, he was protecting them, and he would not lose any of them. Um, uh, very interesting, as I said in verse number 9, of them which thou gavest me have I lost none. Verse number 10, then Simon Peter, having a sword, drew it and smote the high priest's servant and cut off his right ear. The servant's name was Malchus. It is interesting that John knew his name. Many times as you're reading stories about these kinds of things, you don't really have the name of the person that is involved in the incident. Um, this would maybe, and this is just speculation, but it would maybe suggest that Malchus is, is a later a believer. As John is writing these all, thing, all these things down, recounting the events that took place, um, he now knows Malchus. Um, uh, maybe, he, why would he know his name at that time, right? Now he knows the guy's name. Maybe he knew the guy's name at the time. I don't know. But it's just some, there is some speculation that maybe this man became a believer and now John knows who he is. And, and so John put that in there as he wrote out, um, as, as the Holy Spirit dictated, and he wrote out God's word. Um, he puts the guy who got his ear cut off, right? His, his name is specifically in there. Um, uh, and so he, he says here, drew it and smote the, the, priest, uh, the priest's servant. All the other gospel accounts mention that one of the disciples did this. But John is the only gospel one to say that it was Peter. Peter wanted to fulfill his previous promise to defend Jesus at all cost. Though I should die with thee, yet will I not deny thee, he said in Matthew 26, 35. It is interesting what is going to be happening even in the same chapter. Um, it may be significant that John alone mentioned the high priest servant by name, Malchus. And I mentioned this already, right? This is another piece of evidence that John had connections to those in the household of the high priest. It may also indicate that Malchus later became a Christian because often people in the gospel and Acts are named because they were known among the early Christians and John maybe knew who he was as he's recounting and writing, um, the Apostle John is writing this, this down here, um, as I mentioned, right, as the Holy Spirit dictates this. And so here we have this Malchus and, and Peter, um, uh, draws his sword out and then smote the, the ear uh, of the of the of the priest here, the high priest, and smotes his ear. Um, uh, and um, and then verse number eleven. Then said Jesus unto Peter, Put up thy sword unto the the, the sheath, the cup which my father hath given me. Shall I not drink it? Okay. John named Peter as the offender but did not tell that Jesus miraculously healed the cut-off ear of the high priest's servant. Now, we know that his ear was healed by the other accounts, the other Gospels, Luke chapter 22, verse 51. But John never mentions that. It's also kind of interesting. Um, uh, but here we, he does point out, however, unlike the other Gospels, he does point out that it is Peter that did this, and Peter drew the sword, and Peter cut his ear off. Uh, and so uh, Peter oftentimes acting irrationally and, and not thinking before he does things and uh, ready, fire, aim kind of a guy. And so, uh, and so that you know, he's, he's reacting and, and does this um, and, and he's called, called out for it by the Lord in verse number 11. Verse number 12, then the band and the captain and the officers of the, uh, of the Jews took Jesus and bound him. Now, we've already pointed out, right, that they came with weapons 
I don't know, they were anticipating a huge struggle. Um, uh, they took the Lord and they bound him. Uh, but the reality is, it is just the Lord allowing this to happen. Um, he, of course, could have had great victory all, over all of them at any moment. And that's exactly what's demonstrated in verse number 6. As he claimed to be I am, right? They all fell over backwards. And so um, he is powerful, but yet the Lord is submitting to all of this just as God the Father's plan is for him. Verse number 13, and led him away to Annas first, for he was father-in-law to Cephas, which was the high priest that same year. Now Cephas was he which gave counsel to the Jews that it was expedient that one man should die for the people. So verse number 13, um, Annas was the power behind the throne in Jerusalem. This is Bar Barclay here, his commentary. Annas was the power behind the throne in Jerusalem. He himself had been high priest from AD 6 to 15. Four of his sons had also held the high priesthood and Cephas was his son-in-law. So um, Annas would be the man really behind the scenes in control and Cephas was one of the high priests that are currently in power. And the Bible says about Cephas, you know, Cephas gives some words of prophecy. Interestingly enough, in John chapter 11, it was Cephas who advised the Jews that it was expedient that one man should die for the people. This unknowing prophecy of Cephas is recorded in John 11, verse 49 through 53. Without knowing, Cephas spoke the truth that it was good for Jesus to die for the people. Let's take a look at it, John chapter 11. In John chapter 11, they were trying to figure out what to do about Jesus because he had risen someone from the dead, <laughs> Lazarus. And surely, everybody's going to follow this guy now. And the Pharisees were threatened by this. And uh, certainly, you know, what are we going to do about this? And in chapter number 11, starting about verse 45, you know, we began to see, well, verse 47, maybe we began to see they really began to devise a plan. How are we going to make sure to stop this guy? And you get to, to verse 49. Well, let's look at verse 47. Then gather the chief priests and the Pharisees, the council, and said, what do, we, what do we? For this man doeth many miracles. If we let him thus alone, all men will believe on him. And the Romans shall come and take away both our place and nation. Right? So they're very concerned about this. If he gets a bunch of followers, Rome's going to step in and finally do something about this and take away our place as, as these Jewish people. In verse number 49, and one of them, named Cephas, right, this is the very one that, that uh, the Lord is going to come before in, in chapter number 18. Being the high priest that same year said unto them, ye know nothing at all, nor consider that it is expedient for us that one man should die for the people and that the whole nation perish not. Okay, we should let this guy die. We should devise a plan to kill this guy because we could take this one guy out and he'll just be our sacrifice for all the people so that the Roman government doesn't stop all of us, right? Verse 51, And this spake he not of himself, but being high priest that year, he prophesied that Jesus should die for that nation and not for that nation only, but that also he should gather together in one the children of God that were scattered abroad. So the words that he gave may have been convenient for what he was saying at the time, but there certainly were also words of prophecy that Jesus Christ would be the one who died for all. Um, and how interesting that that is. And so they bring him to Cephas here in, in verse number 13 and 14 of chapter number 18. Um, I'm going to give you some practical thoughts tonight. One thing we notice as we look at um, uh, this portion of scripture and the Lord Jesus dealing with uh, his disciples um, and, uh, and them, them, him bringing them to this, you know, the, the Garden of Gethsemane here and a place they were very familiar with that they had been to often. This is how Judas knew how to find them. Um, we saw as Judas came with this band of men, um, however many they are, that the Lord took great steps to protect his disciples while they were there. And I want to talk to you a little bit about 
Jesus protected his disciples, and can we apply some of this to our own lives as the Lord works in our life and has protection for us? Um, several things we see here in these verses, we see the Lord is drawing attention. I mentioned this already, right? Drawing attention to himself. He's protecting um, his disciples and, and getting attention away from them. Um, uh, and, uh, and, and as he protects them, we can see several things here. Number one, he knew all that was going to take place. Verse number four says, Jesus, therefore, knowing all things that should come upon him, went forth and said unto them, Who seek ye? And boy, the fact that we serve a Savior that knows all that's going to happen are those incredible words of comfort. Right? Difficult times come into all of our lives. This last year, we seem to be hit with a lot of it. <laughs> in our church, right? None of it was a surprise to God. The Lord knew of all that was happening, all that was going to come. 2024 definitely has some uncertainties. <laughs> we cannot help but think to ourselves, okay, it's an election year, and our world's going to, our world is, you know, I was about to say our world's going to go up in flames, and it might just go up in flames <laughs> in 2024. Who knows what's going to happen, right? There's no good, there really isn't any good result to the upcoming election, in my opinion. This is only my opinion, right? But there's no good result. Um, uh, it, 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 the possibilities of, of cities being burned to the ground, right? The possibility of violent, it, it's all there. So we look at 2024 and we say to ourselves, man, what is going to happen? It doesn't look like there's a good ending to this. Um, uh, but that being said, right, the Lord knows. The Lord knows everything's going to happen. The Lord knows 2024 all the way to, to December 31st, 2024. Uh, he knows what's going to happen five years from now. Nothing is a surprise to God. And, and what a wonderful truth that that is for us. We can always say, no matter how things seem to be going, this is in God's hands. He knows what's going to happen. It's not a surprise to him, right? He knew what was going to take place. Um, he drew attention to himself. We see that in verse number four. And I already mentioned this several times, but he said, whom seek ye, right? So he began to do a work on the disciples' behalf. Um, and just as the God will do a work on our behalf. He was purposely drawing attention to himself for the sake of well, many, many reasons for this. One of them being, right, the reason you're here in this garden is for me. And, and whom are you seeking? Why are you, why are you after? me? Why are you looking for me? Right? Whom are you looking for? And so he's drawn attention to him and he's immediately doing a work there uh, to take steps of protection for them. God is watching over us and God is doing a work over us. I think it'll be an incredible thing someday to get to heaven and that, that could be the innocent right there. That'll be an incredible thing. But I don't know what God's going to let us do as far as looking at history or looking at what happened on this world. I don't even know if we're even going to care. But if we do, and we're able to look back, I think it would be an interesting thing to see how the spiritual warfare took place behind the scenes while we're going through our day. I mean, how often are there angels battling it out over me? <laughs> uh, uh, or over, over you, right? And uh, how often is there an angel stepping in uh, under God's direction and God protecting you from something that could have been much, much worse? Uh, and, and we just thank God for that, that there's, there's angels watching over us and protecting us. I believe, I believe a prayer is a big part of that. Um, as we are praying for each other, and God is, is answering those prayers and how important that it is. And so um, he drew attention to himself. He's immediately doing a work to uh, protect them. Um, uh, he, he displayed his power in verse number six. And we saw that, right? As soon as he said as unto them, I am he, they went backwards and, and fell to the ground. And, and the disciples did not need to worry. Jesus had all power. No matter what was going to happen over the next couple you know, days or hours that are left here in his life, no matter how, what direction he's going to go or what, what's going to happen to him, we can see here, wait a minute, the Lord Jesus is all powerful. And they don't have to worry. Now, they did. I mean, they had all kinds of different reactions than they should have had at the death of the Lord Jesus. Uh, but the reality is that we don't have to fret. We don't have to worry. The Lord Jesus is doing a work in our lives. And, and uh, we can know that he is all-powerful. Nothing is beyond his 
what he can handle in his control. Um, you can do anything God would have you to do because it's all within his control and he can, he can handle it. Uh, and it's up to us to say, Lord, I'm, I'm giving it over to you. You take care of this. Um, this is your, uh, this is your, uh, I need you to, you need to handle this and take care of this. Right? He continued to draw their attention. Now, this is interesting because verse number seven, it says, and asked he them again, whom seek ye? And they said, Jesus of Nazareth, right? So he knocks them all over. Maybe they didn't remember what just happened. Maybe they woke up really dis disorientated, thinking, what just happened? Where, where are we? Why are we here? And then he asked them again, right? Uh, my point is, with this point, right, Jesus, the Lord Jesus continues to do his work in our life. It's not just a one-time thing that happened. The Lord has a daily, moment-by-moment -moment interest in you in helping you, in guiding you. The Holy Spirit continues to work in our lives, and we continue to have to lean on him and learn from him um, as he continues to do his work. And the Lord does do this, continue to do his work in our life, right? He kept his promise, verse 8 and 9. Um, Jesus answered, I have told you that I am he. If therefore ye seek me, let uh, these go their way, that the saying might be fulfilled, which he spake of them which thou gavest me, I have lost none. Right? The Lord... Uh, what God says will come true. Um, he kept his promise. You know, I talked earlier about, you know, focusing on something in the Bible as you're reading it. It helps you pay attention, right? Wouldn't be a bad idea to think to yourself, what is, what is God promising me? What's the promise of God? If I get up tomorrow morning and I may read the proverb of the day or I'm going through the New Testament, you know, maybe I'm at the book of Revelation here, you know, at the end of the year, whatever it is. As I'm reading through it, is there any place I can see and I read what I read today, did God promise something to me with this? And you begin to maybe write down God's promises. That's a good, that'd be a great thing to do, right? Because that's something we can rely on. God's going to keep his promise. Um, and so God kept his promise. And, and his protection of us is to keep the promises he has made to us. And God will continue to keep his promise. Um, he showed patience, verse 10 and 11. And Simon Peter, having a sword, drew it and smote the high priest's servant and cut off his right ear. The servant's name was uh, Malchus. And then, uh, then said, Jesus unto Peter, put up thy sword into the sheath, the cup which my father hath given me. Shall I not drink it? Okay, right? He's working with Peter and shows patience with Peter here. And, and, uh, and Peter was the kind of guy, right, that reacted. By the way, this is the one that is going to deny the Lord Jesus coming up pretty quick here as we get into this chapter. Um, and the Lord knew that Peter was going to deny him. But yet the Lord still worked with Peter. Aren't we thankful? The Lord's patient with us. Aren't we thankful that God shows patience um, in our lives? Okay, he showed mercy. Luke 22, um, uh, 51, even to his enemies he showed mercy. Luke 22. Here we have Peter cutting the ear off with this guy. Peter, an overreactor, right? Luke twenty two fifty one. I hope I got the right verse down here. <clears throat> and Jesus answered and said, Suffer ye thus far. And he touched his ear and healed him, right? So the, the very ear that was cut off, right, the Lord healed him and God shows mercy. Here's God showing mercy to the guys that are coming to the garden to, to, to bind him and to haul him away. Um, but yet when Peter reacts and cuts off this guy's ear, um, uh, the Lord Jesus in Luke twenty two fifty one shows mercy and heals, heals this man. Uh, and praise the Lord for God's mercy. You know, we ought to thank God for his mercy and his long suffering uh, because the reality is you and I don't deserve it. Um, people have oftentimes said to me, I'm going to close soon here, but people have oftentimes said to me, Pastor, there's so much, it seems like there's so much violence in the Old Testament. Um, it seems like there's so much that, you know, just seems like, boy, God just didn't, you know, someone collected sticks on the Sabbath and they were stoned to death. You know, what, what's up with that? You know, people would say, Pastor, what's up with that? And my answer to that really is, God is never wrong uh, to, to judge sin. Um, God is completely righteous. That's what Romans 9 is all about, right? In his righteousness, he could judge sin, and he wouldn't be wrong in doing so. And thank God he shows mercy. Because the reality is all of us just deserve a judgment for our sin. But yet God shows mercy to us, and what a wonderful thing that that is. Uh, and by the way, if you pay attention as you read through the Old Testament, there's nothing you look for while you're reading, right? 
Um, look for God's mercy and God's love as you're reading through the Old Testament. You'd be surprised how often you see the Lord is showing mercy all throughout the Bible. Um, and what a wonderful thing it is. God shows mercy, and he shows mercy even to his enemies, even to those that were um, uh, going to haul him away and take him away. We have the mercy of God. God's protecting us. God shows mercy towards us. God shows love towards us and patience with us and keeps his promises. And what a wonderful thing it is that we have God's protection. Let's have a word of prayer, and we'll take up our prayer request for tonight. Let's pray. Lord Jesus, we do thank you so much for all that you have uh, blessed us with. And Lord, I pray that you would uh, be with us as we serve you. End of the year here, Lord, going into a new year. I pray that you would help us to love you and to know you better. Continue to do your work in our lives. Um, thank you for the example that you've given to us in your life. Lord, help us to rely and trust in you. Guide and work in our lives. Thank you for what you've given to us. In Jesus' name we pray these things.